that's a bit hot that mate. Well here we are again, another year passed, Christmas upon us, new year just around the corner, probably got a few weeks of cold weather to come now, but before we know it spring will be on its way and I for one can't wait for that. I've already been thinking ahead to where I'm going to be fishing this coming spring. Clear head, fresh start, exciting times ahead, can't wait. For now though, we're going to go all the way back to 2003, what, 16 years ago now? Jeez, time flies. And uh, I'm going to tell you a story, it's one of my favourite captures and it's from my second book. Uh, lovely old carp, long scaly one, and I think at the time I called the water the clear pit. But like I say, it's a long time ago now, the, the, the big fish is long gone. Uh, so I see no harm in calling the lake by its real name, which is Sheepwalk. Back in 2003, Sheepwalk, it was probably better known for its big tench. In fact, it had some giants. And a friend of mine, an old friend, Tetley, he caught the British record there at £15.3. ounces. In fact, it, unless that's been broken in recent times, I believe that's still the record today. Monster, £15.10, tench. can you just imagine that? There was obviously uh, some carp in there as well, not many, quite a low stock. Um, and thinking back to spring of 2003, which is when I first started, look I had looked around it when I was a lot younger, when I was sort of 18, 20. But let's go, we'll start at 2003. And in the spring of 2003, I remember going for a walk over there and um, Martin Bowler had given me a bell actually. He was over there tench fishing. And I popped in for a cup of tea with Martin. And while I was sat there, in fact I've got a map here, and I remember, Martin was fishing down in this corner, but while I was sat there drinking tea with Martin, we were seeing fish showing in open water. Carp, one after another, the wind was blowing down there. And I didn't even have a ticket for the lake at the time, but I went home, bought a ticket straight away, uh, and I was back at the lake the very next day. Martin was still there, hadn't even packed up. Although he had, he had actually moved, he'd moved around a little bit closer to where the carp was, but bearing in mind he was fishing for the tent, he wasn't so interested in the carp. So I plotted up next to Martin, we had a nice social that evening, and in the morning I caught one, my first carp out of the lake. It's not much for, what, what's the story without a picture? And I can't find a picture of that one, so I'm afraid we, we won't go into too much detail of it. But it was a 19 pound common. So that was how I started on the lake, in May sort of time. And I must have had other places on my mind. I think I fished the Yateley Car Park Lake and the Road Lake and whatever that summer. Because it wasn't until September time that I went back. And at first it was just a bit of a recce. I went there early in the morning. Um, first light, made myself a flask, I had all my kit with me but I left that in the car and I, st I remember there was a, you got a motorway running up one bank which you couldn't fish from but the last swim that you could get to it was a big grassy swim and I sat there at first light with my old flask watching the lake, it was all misty. For the time of year it was mid-September but for the time of year it was very warm, we'd had some, quite a lot of sunny weather and although I'd hoped to see those fish showing out in the open water, I must have sat there for a couple of hours without seeing a thing. I think I saw one, and I only remember this because I've gone back to my book, but I remember seeing a little tench clip the service, that was about it. Well, later on in the morning, once the old sun had got high enough in the sky to make an impression, I went for a stroll round. Now, up, up one end of the lake, you had a couple of islands. It's quite a sizeable lake, this, about 30, 35 acres, deep as well. But up one end of the lake, you had a couple of islands, and behind the island was a channel really snaggy, loads of overhanging trees and snags in the water. And there was a swim, there was two or three swims along the channel, but there was a swim about halfway along, which faced a gap between these two islands. If you imagine, uh, you've got the swim here, and a gap, that took an island to the right, all overhanging trees and snags on it, and then another island to the left, a long island, again, the snaggiest, carpiest channel you can imagine, you know? And it was very, very weedy at the time. Uh, I think at that time of the year, you know, when you get the sun and what have you, it starts to, all the weed starts to gas up and peel off the bottom. And it was quite shallow in that channel as well. But while I was stood there watching, I saw some movement in, in the weed up to the right. There was clumps of weed everywhere. But to get a better look, there were some brambles to the right of the swim. And there was an old tunnel going through these brambles. And just, just the other side of the tunnel was a little willow tree overhanging the water's edge. So I had to open out the tunnel a bit more. I climbed through, got up the willow tree, crystal clear water. I've got photos of all this, so it probably explain it a little bit better, but once I was up the willow tree, you could sort of crouch down and then look beyond the channel, through the channel, and then out into the open lake. And there was all, you could see uh, in between all the clumps of weed, you could see all the sandy spots where it was all cleaned off. But more, more than likely, it was where the weed had peeled up off the bottom, leaving little yellow patches here and there. And while I was up that tree, I saw two carp, two commons, both long ones, long, lean 30-pounders. 
which was what the lake was mainly well known for, you know, carp-wise anyway. There wasn't very many, many mirrors in there. Anyway, I watched those fish feeding. They were feeding virtually below the little willow tree that I was up. And I, and I watched them until they disappeared. Uh, and then I put in a couple of ounces of pellets, eight millers, halibut marine pellets. Left them to it. Uh, and if I remember rightly, I actually went back to the car and I drove off to another lake. I went to the road lake, uh, which was on the old CMEX angling ticket. And it gives you an idea of just how warm the weather was for that time of the year. But I was floater fishing that day on the road lake and I'd been feeling really, well, really, really well on the floaters. Um, in fact, I remember I, my intention was to head back to the sheep walk lake in the evening, uh, which I did, but because I'd had those fish feeding on floaters so well, I'd left it a little bit late, you know, and the traffic was a little bit sticky. And by the time I'd, I'd got to, back to the sheep walk, uh, made my way to the swim, and the light was already starting to go by then, you know. Um, to make things worse as well, I remember all, all the weed clumps had got worse still, you know, whereas in the morning there'd been weed clumps all over the place. By now it was just, all, it was almost one solid raft of weed. And there must have been a, a minute or two before I even took the rucksack off my back, you know, because I was just sort of stood there wondering how I was going to present the bait for all that lot. If it wasn't for what happened next, I may well have gone to a different swim, but while I was stood there with my rucksack on my back, I just saw a little bit of movement to the right, just a little bit of the weed moved and created a hole, you know. And as this hole sort of opened and then started to close again, I just saw the back end of a cart, the sweeping tail and back end of it as one swung through underneath the... Just like looking through a little window, you know? But I just see him swing through and, and disappear from sight. Anyway, uh, the old kit went down a little bit sharpish. Um, light was going, like I say, you know, like the only way I was going to fish that night was with a couple of PVA bags, which is what I'd done. I tied up a couple of solid bags and just flicked them out through the weed. And the intention was to get up at first light and then redo the rods properly. Anyway, I slept well that night. And I remember I woke up at first light with a bit of a start. And you wake up, what was that type thing? And as I opened my eyes, dead in front of me, probably 15 to 20 yards out, you had the island deer and an island deer with a channel going through the middle of them. And right where the channel was, there was a big set of rings. It obviously what had woke me up, one had just, just rolled over. Uh, anyway, so within about a minute of uh, waking up, I'm already reeling in one of the rods. It was all dripping with weed and that. It wasn't fishing, you know. I'd just done my best in, in, in the late evening. Um, but I put on a fresh rig, nice new sharp hook. It was just a knotless knot, size six big T, uh, 15 mil sauce boilie at the time. And I flicked it out to where, the, where this fish had shown. It was quite snaggy there, you've got an island to the right, island to the left, and then where the channel was, there was actually some scaffold poles and metal work poking out of the water. Real, real snaggy area. But there was a bit of a shallow bar there as well. So I just put a rod out there, donked, put about 40 boilies around it, that was one rod sorted. For the other rod, you can imagine where I wanted that, I wanted it exactly where I'd seen those two 30 pound commons feeding the day before. But whereas the day before I could see the spots, now I had to climb through the, uh, crawl through the tunnel in the brambles, but once I got there and got up the willow, I could see that there was too much weed. I couldn't even see the spot anymore. So I, went, I got back down the tree, went back to my swim, got my marker rod. Uh, you couldn't carry it through the bramble set up. You know, it was a tight, I had to go on my hands and knees, you know. But I took my marker rod through, got up the tree with my marker rod, shipped it together. And then with the float and lead, I just put it through the weed and then slowly opened out a window, you know, just sort of dragged the weed and created a little strip. I've got photos of this, like I say, so you'll be able to see exactly what I mean. But Whereas the day before, once I'd made this little window, whereas the day before there was lots of weed on the bottom as well with just a couple of little yellow bits about this size, now it was just one long grey strip where literally the bottom had been turned right over. In fact, I could even see that a little bit of a blue carrier bag poking out the bottom, which wasn't there the day before. So the carp had clearly been in there and turned it right over, you know. So I've got a spot, and before I'd created that spot as well, I'd already got that rod ready to go. And because the, uh, the day before I'd seen that the bottom there was quite weedy, I'd set up with a little PVA stick, just a few crushed boilies and a little bit of ground bait. So the, I made the, the window through the weed, uh, got me proper rod, gone back through, got up the tree, and, I, and I'd done it from the tree. Rather, from the bank you couldn't see the spot, but I climbed up the tree with the old rod and almost just sw all, virtually lowered it in, just swung it out and lowered it into this little hole. The, weed, the line was sort of draped across the surface weed to get to the hole, you know. Anyway, um, after that, I've then started pinging a few 10 mil boilies around it. And I can see the, see the PVA stick on the bottom melting and breaking down and getting bigger on the bottom, you know, the water was crystal clear. And as I'm throwing these baits in, I'm starting to look at that PVA stick and I'm starting to have doubts, you know, I'm thinking, that's blatant. Like, really, I didn't want to stick on there, you know, I would have rather just had two 10 millers, little short hook link. 
anyway, I didn't have too much time to think about it because while I'm watching, from the right, coming up the channel, I've seen a bow wave coming towards me. It's got, there's all clumps of weed everywhere. It's disappeared underneath these clumps of weed and the next clearing is my clearing. So now my eyes are focused on, on the edge of this clearing, you know. And as I've watched, what well, was tap clear, as I'm watching, I've seen his head come through, just appeared the other side of the weed. And I've seen him inch forward and, and snuff, he's snuffling the 10 millers one at a time. And each time he took one, you see the puff of silk come up from around him, crystal clear. In a way, it's come closer and closer, another 10 miller, a little puff of silk, another 10 miller. And it's got to about a foot away from my PVA stick, which like I say, is blatant. It's like a red, red patch of ground bait laying on the, on the bottom, much more than I wanted, you know. Um, Anyway, no time to think about it, so I've got down from the tree and I'm sat behind the rod, I'm expecting it to go. A few minutes have passed, nothing's happened, I've got back up the tree again and it's gone. So I thought, right, by this time, I think I definitely, definitely want to change that rig, I don't want that PVA stick on there. So I've crept through, back through the tunnel in the brambles to my swim, sat down on my bed and started to tie another rig together. Bottom baits, this, uh, just two little 10 millers, little short hook link. I've got it all ready, I've popped it into a little baiting up pouch with a pair of scissors. All I had to do was chop the lead core, put the new click on and tie the lead back on. Anyway, before doing that, I thought I'd better have another look from the tree. And I've got up the tree, and whereas only five, ten minutes earlier the water was crystal clear, now it had a milky, it was, it was turning coloured, and the big one is down there feeding, literally inches away from where my little PVA stick is. And, and where the water's getting coloured, now I'm not so fussed about changing the, the presentation, you know, I think, well, that'll be all right now, he's colouring it up anyway. So I've got back down from the tree, Imagine that the, the bait is only, my rig is only about 15 feet out in front of the bank. So I sat down behind the rod, it's all brambles and that very, very tight little gap, sat down. And at that point I remember my landing net. I only had the one net. Um, nowadays I'd always advise you to take two nets with you. But I had one net at the time and that was through the tunnel of brambles where my other rod was. But looking like a tape was imminent, oh, I needed my net. So I've gone back through the brambles, got my net, I had to, had to collapse it down to carry it through the brambles got back through, shipped the net together and sat back down. I'd only been sat back down a minute or two and, I've, and a buzzer as one noted, just, just out of the blue, it's just melted. Now obviously my first instinct is straight to the rod that's in front of me where I've just had the big one feeding. But as I've gone over it, like the spool's not turning, nothing's got, and it suddenly dawned on me, it's my other rod. And I've started to run, I've started to get, get through the brambles, I've got halfway, then remembered me landing there. Oh, no. And the rod's belting off, like, you know, off a tight clutch and it's really snaggy as well. So I've gone back, like I've got the net, I haven't got time to, to, to break it down, and I've, I've attempted to drag it through the brambles, you know? I've got about three quarters of the way through the brambles. All the while, the, the, the buzzer has been no, one note in now for several seconds, you know, and I'm close to snags. But I abandoned, uh, I abandoned the net right at the entrance, grabbed the rod, and, and I'm thinking it's already going to be through that channel. But as luck would have it, really lucky in fact, the fish had, had swung right. And it had gone underneath, I mean this island to the right was covered in snags and big overhang, but it went underneath the whole lot without picking up anything, kept going right, and as it's going right it's picking up clumps of weed as well on the main line. And it's just kept going right and swung all the way in to the margin beyond that little willow tree that I'd earlier been, been watching from. Anyway, uh, it's bogged down in weed. Um, and I'm on the bank at this point, and between me and the little willow and where the fish has swung into the bank, there was another bush hanging out from the edge. So my line's sort of going round the side of that bush. But I just kept up the pressure, and, it's, and it started to come, started to come, but very, very slowly, heavy, load of weed on the line, you know. And as I started to do that, the other rod started to bleep, bip, 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 it's gone through the other line, which is a disaster, the other side of a big snag tree, you know. And you know when you, like luckily the clutch wasn't too tight, so I'd put, pull it a little bit and then it'd go, duh, duh, Da, 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 da. And then you do it again, da, 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 da. managing to take line off the other rod. And eventually I've got this big clump of weed coming towards me. It's got to the edge of the bush and sort of locked up on the bush. So I've had to get into the lake and I'm up to here now in water. Like, you know, I've got the net at my side. I managed to tease this clump of weed round the bush. Now all the while while I'm playing this, I'm, 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 I'm expecting it to be one of those two 30 pound commons that I'd seen the day before. The, the big scaly mirror is the last fish on my mind because I've just been watching that feeding on the other spot. And to get from there to where my other rod was was about 20 yards. But, um, so I'm imagining it's going to be a common. Like, you know, I've got it all into the net and I've started to part the old weed and then the old scaly flanks of a mirror have appeared. So I don't know how it happened, but that fish quite literally must have, as, as I'd set my net up in that little margin spot by the willow, that fish must have ups and left that spot and swam straight over to where, where my other rod was. And I'd pinged about 40 baits around that other rod as well. But I reckon it must have taken my hook bait as one of the very first ones. It was that quick. 
when you luck in, do you know what I mean? But there he is, he's in the net. I took all the weed out from around it, and sure enough, it was the long scaly one. Absolutely magical carp. I've got a couple of cuttings, which I found in the old pressure's drawer. One of my old mate, Benny Hamilton, with the great fish, which would have been a couple of years before me. And something else I found as well, you know, back in the days before iPads and iPhones, we always used to print off the Google Earth images. And uh, this one was obviously very well worn and open because I put a little bit of tape on the back to stop it falling apart. But I think, being honest, it was probably more for the big lake next door to it, which is another story, one from my next book. But that was the lake that, uh, that that's sheep book. That's where the big long scaly mirror lived. So yeah, quite a short campaign that one, you know, that's how it goes. Some of them you, you can be there for a year or two and uh, another ones you get lucky enough to catch the big one within your first bite or, or two. Um, but I remember my old mate Ev wasn't best pleased with me, <laughs> do you know what I mean? It was meant to be somewhere that we were going to be having a social trip together and that and, and he's driven all the way from Birkenhead and I've rung him up on his way down saying I've got the big one already. Um, I don't know where we went after that, I think we probably went off and spent a couple of nights on the canal. But yeah. Uh, good old Dev, he done the pictures for me, like I said, at the back of the swim, we weighed it, £39.9 9 ounces. I've been lucky enough to catch one or two bigger ones in my time, but sometimes it's the real lookers that stick in the mind most, and that one is right up there with my favourites. Happy Christmas and best of luck for the new year.